Uh, thank you for coming again, everybody, and w welcome back. I hope I'm not um, boring you to death uh, as, as we go through this. Uh, just to recap where we, where we left off yesterday, we are talking about <clears throat> scientific realism. Scientific realism is the view that most commoner garden scientists would have. They don't necessarily adhere to each and every point, but they would certainly put themselves in the school of scientific realists as a preference to the other schools that we've dealt with. Um, so the sorts of things they, that they believe in, that they adhere to, is that there is a reality out there, that botanists who are studying trees believe that there are such things as trees that exist in the world. Computer scientists who study logic circuits believe that there is such a thing as a semiconductor, that there is such a thing as silicon, that it is a reality. It's not in the mind. It's not made up. It's not imagination or dreams or anything else. It is real and it is out there. That's the first thing that they believe. The second is that this reality that exists is a lawful reality. That, that is, semiconductors operate on the basis of certain laws. Semiconductors have certain characteristics. They're you know, lawful characteristics. Semiconductors don't behave in random ways, in any old way. They behave in certain ways. Trees are lawful beings, if I could use that funny expression, lawful. There are certain laws connected with photosynthesis and so forth, osmosis and so on, which can be understood in regard uh, to trees. That's the reality of it. This reality is singular. Semiconductors, silicon, acts as semiconductors and silicon no matter what the time and no matter what the place. It doesn't, a semiconductor do, doesn't just suddenly change its mind and start behaving in some unlawful way. If it does, that means you've got the law wrong. You don't know what the law of semiconducting is. Right? So it's singular and it's lawful. The third thing is that you can know about it. You can know about trees. Botanists believe that. Zoologists believe you can know about animals. Computer scientists believe you can know about semiconductors. So, there is a reality. The reality is singular and lawful and we can know that reality. Now, how does the botanist or the zoologist or the computer scientist or the chemist know about the reality that they're studying. Well, they claim, they make, they're able to make these knowledge claims, these scientific knowledge claims, which are different to other kinds of knowledge claims, don't forget. They're able to make these scientific knowledge claims on the basis that the claims have been tested. You can make a claim about a semiconductor only if you've tested that claim about the semiconductor. You can make a claim about osmosis in trees if you have tested osmosis in trees. Now, how do you test it? What do you test it against? You test it against the reality of the tree. You test it against the reality of the behaviour of the semiconductor. You don't test it against um, something you read in a book, you know, for example. You test it against empirical reality. Your knowledge of the tree or your knowledge of the semiconductor is deeply explanatory. It's not enough just to describe what happens, just to describe what you see. That's not scientific knowledge. Scientific knowledge 
explains the law by which osmosis in trees operates or by which the behaviour of electrons passing through a semiconductor operate. So it's deeply explanatory, not just based on observations. The knowledge, and here we get three, three alternative claims that different scientists would adhere to, depending on what you're talking about and depending on what the discipline is. And they go from the strongest claim to the weakest claim, although the weakest claim is still pretty strong, in my opinion. Okay, the strongest claim is that scientific knowledge can be the truth. can be wrong too, but, in, it, it, but it can be true. It can make truthful statements about electrons, about osmosis and about trees. That is, statements which actually refer in an isomorphic way, they map onto in a one-to-one -one way between the statement, whether it's a mathematical formula or whether it's a hypothesis written in English, that that map actually maps one-to-one -one in an isomorphic way onto the truth of the behaviour of the semiconductor or the tree. So scientific knowledge can be truthful. Truthful claims, truthful claims or claims that fit you know, this category might be claims like the speed of light may not be exceeded. Physicists would regard that as a truthful claim. Um, the second law of th thermodynamics in its application to heat entropy would be regarded as a truthful claim. Okay. Then you've got a second somewhat weaker set of claims, the similitude. And here the scientist is not necessarily is not necessarily making a claim to absolute and justifiable truth, but is saying that it is truth like. Now, a claim there, a claim in that category might be that there is a relation between the quantity of carbon dioxide in the air and the behaviour of the climate. That claim has verisimilitude. It is, has a truth-like nature. But it, 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 it's not a claim to absolute truth because climate science acknowledges that there is plenty about the behaviour of the atmosphere in relation to carbon dioxide that is not known, that is not understood. There is a lot that is known and a lot that is understood, and in that way the claims of climate scientists are truth-like. They're close to the truth. But they might not go so far as the physicists would when they're talking about something like the speed of light or something like um, the second law of thermodynamics. Uh, a third and again, so, again somewhat weaker one is inference to the best explanation. And here the scientist is saying, well, we're not claiming that there's a one-to-one -one isomorphic mapping between our propositions and reality. And we're not even claiming the similitude here. We're not even claiming that we've got a, a good grasp. Not perfect, but you know, we're not even claiming a good grasp. But we are claiming to have the best grasp, the best understanding. And something in that category might be the work that cosmologists have, have done into... Uh, matter in the universe. Now you, you'll know uh, about 80%, 83% of the mass of the universe is unaccounted for. Well, it is accounted for. It's accounted for through the proposition that there is such a thing as dark matter and dark energy. 
Dark matter and dark energy is proposed to account for over 80% of the mass of the universe. Now, what is this dark matter? What is this dark energy? The cosmologists and the physicists, the particle physicists, will say, well, we're not entirely sure what it is. We can't see it because it doesn't respond to light. It doesn't respond to any, uh, any other spectrum either, X-ray spectrums and so forth. Uh, we know it's there. there. There is clear evidence that this entity is there, but exactly what the character of, uh, uh, and the properties of this entity that we're calling dark matter and dark energy, exactly what they are, we're not sure. So the term dark matter and dark energy is like a placeholder. It has semiotic value here, but it doesn't claim to map onto the truth of the existence of this stuff. It doesn't make that claim. So what claim does it make? Well, it, claim the, the, it, it has um, it's widespread acceptance among particle physicists and cosmologists because it's the best explanation to posit the existence of dark matter and dark energy of, provides a better explanation than any other explanation offers. Okay, so there you get three different um, truth uh, criteria, if you like, for, uh, for the scientific realists. Now, that, uh, that, that summarises um, wh where we're up to, and today uh, what we're going on to talk about is some problems with this, some problems with scientific realism, and you'll see that there are two, I'll point, point out to you um, the two uh, most important problems uh, that, that under the fact that um, scientific theories and propositions are underdetermined, uh, and the, the second one, perhaps a more powerful one, is the historical record of scientific propositions. So th those are a couple of difficulties that scientific realists have to deal with. There are also alternatives to scientific realism. Alternatives which suggest that scientific realism is not the inference to the best explanation. That the best explanation for scientific knowledge is not reality, is not the existence, is not a one-to-one -one isomorphic mapping of scientific propositions to reality. And a number of alternative propositions are put here, better, allegedly better explanations, instrumentalism, scientific paradigms, scientific ethos and so forth. Uh, so uh, we'll, we'll go through those today. Okay. Um, the, the first two, um, first here. <clears throat> the problems with, uh, pr uh, pr the, the problem with scientific realism that <clears throat> The claim that all scientific facts are underdetermined. Um, bear with me one sec. I'm a, I'm a bit out of order here. Ah, here we go. Um, consider a set of consider a data set um, such as this. In, that looks like a lovely proposition, doesn't it? That, that looks like quite a clear proposition and one would infer from, this, from these data points that sort of inductive inference here. That, that, that sort of relation would be, may well be inferred uh, 